Well, welcome back, everybody. We are on our second to last video, and today we're talking about the scent life. You know, I think something that's so important for us to understand is that Jesus, as it says in John 10.10, 10, came so that we would have life and have it abundantly. But his desire is not just that we would have this abundant life and keep it to ourselves. Part of his plan is that the abundant life that we have would impact others and draw us to go out into the world hmm. so that they could see what a life lived out for Jesus really looks like and that they would want it. The seeking life has to come before the sent life. Amen. Right. If we're not seeking God, much of the things we go out and do are just our own ideas and our own desires and our own thinking. And yet God is at work around us. God loves the world that he gave his only begotten son. And there's no doubt that the scriptures over and over again tell us that there are good works that he's prepared in advance to do. He's given us gifts to go out there and, and do certain things that would build up the body and that would go out and reach the world. And otherwise he would have just saved us, taken us home and uh, so we could have a perfect relationship with him all the time. But he left us here. He left us here so that we could minister to others and enjoy him while we're living in this life. So I was thinking uh, as we got into this session of Psalm 46, it starts in verse 7. It says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And he says, Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars ceased to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear, burns the chariots with fire. But then he says, be still. Be still and know that I am God. If we want to go out and do the works that God wants us to do, even though there might be noise all around us, he wants to speak to us. He wants us to be hearing from him. He wants us to be walking with him. That when we go, we should be going where he's going and where he's working. So our first point is, do you truly comprehend your need for Jesus? Because if we don't understand our need for Jesus, and that's causing us to seek him, we're not going to understand the desperate need others have for Jesus, and we're not going to feel compelled to go out and reach them with the gospel. It makes me think of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah sees the king and he says, woe is me, I'm ruined. I, I might be a decent guy, but in comparison to God, I am ruined, I'm doomed, I'm destined for hell. But what it also opens his eyes to is the wickedness of his own people. Mm. He's a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. So you see God clearly, you see yourself clearly, and you see the need of the people clearly. Mm. It's only from an understanding of that need for God that we'll be compelled to go out into the world with a message, the only message that meets that need. It's interesting as we went on in that passage, one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar and he touched my mouth. It's like he cleansed him. There's something about spending that time with God when we're seeking God that that's when he's doing that work within our heart. He's making us holy before him so that we're usable. And he says, here I am, send me. Yeah. But if he hadn't seen himself clearly because mm -hmm. he saw the holiness of God and understood the need of his people and that he could be forgiven yeah. and have his guilt atoned for, yeah. he wouldn't have gone. Yeah. So if we are having a struggle going, maybe it's because we have a struggle knowing mm. our need for him. Yeah. Our next point is our calling. So what is the calling Jesus has on our life? I think of Acts chapter 13, where they were fasting and praying. They were spending time with God, and the Holy Spirit told them to send out for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them to. So no doubt you think, oh, Paul and Barnabas, they're special people. 
But uh, doesn't the Bible also say that uh, the fields are white, Matthew 9, 35 or so, the fields are white unto harvest? Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the fields. The fields are white. The laborers are few. So we're to pray for them to send people out. There's good works that I have been called to do, to, that I should finish those works. Amen. I think of, as well, the Great Commission passage. Yeah. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go out into all the nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and behold, I am with you even to the mm. end of the age. So he says, go out into the nations. Jesus says to the disciples after he raises from the dead, he comes to them in John chapter 20, verse 21, and mm. it says, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So in the same way the Father sent the Son into the world to reach the world, Jesus, having accomplished what is necessary to save the world, sends us with this message, the message of reconciliation, that we can have peace with God, that we can have our sins forgiven, that we can have this abundant life. He calls us to go out into the world and reach the world that God loves so much that he died for that. I like the passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. So here's the chain. So you have Paul, you have Timothy, then he has entrust to faithful men. That's the third step. Who will be able to teach others also? So there's a chain that goes on. Paul uh, had Timothy. He discipled him. Timothy had was told to go and commit to faithful people who would be able to commit to other people. So it's it's not just Paul, it's not just Barnabas, it's not just Timothy, it's other faithful people. Now this is a scary thing to go out into the world, yeah, isn't it? It so sure is. We can have confidence though because of the gift that Jesus gives us. So what is our confidence? Notice in Acts 1.8, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Hmm. Jesus doesn't send out the apostles, the disciples, until they have the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, until they have the Holy Spirit, they're boxed up in the upper room. Mm -hmm. They're still fearful, even after Jesus has risen from the dead. But when they receive the Holy Spirit, we see transformed, spirit-empowered people who are doing things that only people could do by the provision of God's Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so that's our confidence. We don't go out on our own. Jesus says, behold, I'll be with you even until the end of the age. And this isn't just like fluffy, you know, talk that's supposed to comfort us. Jesus is really with us because the Holy Spirit lives within us. Yeah. So we can have confidence that he's fighting the battle for us, that the work he calls us to, he'll empower us to accomplish it yeah. because he's the one in us to will and to work for his good pleasure and to accomplish the works he's prepared for us before. Yeah. yeah, he's not sending us out there with an empty toolbox. No. I've given you everything that you need that pertains to life and godliness. He says in, in Matthew chapter 10, he called his 12 disciples and gave them authority mm -hmm. over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. He took a ragtag group of guys that were tax collectors and smelly fishermen and, uh, and zealots and he, he said, I'm going to use you. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the authority. I'll give you the power. I'll give you everything you need. Don't worry about what you're going to say or how you're going to say it. I'll give you the right words when you get out there. But I think he's looking to see if we're willing to go. I don't think God needs our ability. I think he just needs our availability. 
He will equip us. The power comes from him. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to the spirit. And so when we're dependent upon him, when we're surrendered to him, when he's sanctifying us, we're seeking him, we're being still before him. It's then that he fills us with the spirit and he is the one that produces the fruit. I am crucified with Christ, right? Nevertheless, I live yet not but I, but Christ lives in me. Amen. It's the spirit of God working through us that enables anything of any spiritual value to be accomplished. Amen. I know for me, whether I'm evangelizing out in the streets or even when I'm preaching a message here, my confidence is not in myself yeah. or in my knowledge or my studies, but in the spirit. Yet we do need to know what the gospel is. Yeah. So what is the content of the message that we're proclaiming? What do we need to know in order to share the life transforming, saving gospel of Jesus Christ? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures the message is simple it's hard to understand if if the spirit's not working there the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of god but when god is there and the holy spirit's working christ died for our sins somebody told me that successful witnessing is simply taking the initiative in the power of the holy spirit and leaving the results to god Amen. Yeah. So it's the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's, I take an initiative when the Holy Spirit's working. Ripe fruit, you don't have to pull off. You just touch it and it'll come off. I don't have to, eat, I don't have to pull on unripened fruit. Take the initiative in the power of the Holy Spirit and he leaves the results to God. Because he's at work. Something else that I think is essential is the testimony of our changed life. Mm -hmm. I think of a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Uh, yes. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, or drunkards, or revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. There's transformation that comes as a result of the gospel. He says, yeah. you guys used to struggle with this. That's who you were, but now you're changed. And actually, our testimony is so essential because while we did not see physically the resurrected Jesus with our eyes, our transformed life makes us a firsthand witness of the power of the resurrected Jesus. The way Jesus has and continues to transform your life is testimony, proof, evidence that he is alive, that he is the king, and that others need to believe in him as well. Everyone is an expert in what God has done in their life. If God has done something in your life, you should be able to witness. A witness isn't saving anybody. A witness is just giving testimony to what God has done in you. So if God has done something in you and something in me, I should know what he's done in me. It's hard to refute what, when somebody shares with what God has done in their life. It's hard. You might not believe in God, you, but it's hard to refute what God has done for them. And you, if you have come to Christ, then you have a testimony. You have a story of what God has done in your life. And that's what he wants us to do. He just wants us to share the story of what he's done in our life. 
So when we share the gospel, we are giving witness, bearing testimony to who Jesus is and to what he's done. Mm -hmm. I think of what John says at the end of his gospel. John, a firsthand witness, says, I've written these things so that you would know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, Mm -hmm. you would have life in his name. So he shares with them what he knows to be true, who Jesus is and what he's done on the cross so that they can believe it, and as a result of believing it, have eternal life. To get to a little bit more practical side of this, there are some things that we can do that would hinder our witness. So the first question is, am I living a life that is consistent with my confession? I say that Jesus is my Lord. Am I living like it? I say that I love Jesus. Does my life demonstrate that? As we've been teaching through the Gospel of John and Anchor Bible Institute, there are three passages that really stand out to me, and I'll just reference them. In John 13, he says, Love one another as I have loved you. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples. Mm -hmm. So the world knows that we're Jesus' disciples when we love one another like Jesus loved us. In John chapter 15, Jesus says this about himself. I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. So Jesus walks in perfect obedience in order to demonstrate his love for the Father. He calls us in multiple places, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So our obedience to God demonstrates our love for him. And if the world knew Jesus loved the Father because he was obedient to the Father, I think that plays a major part in our testimony as well. Are you walking in obedience? Our part then, though, is people would say, well, I got problems in my life, so therefore they do nothing. Mm. What should they do then? Or get their life straightened out, I guess. <laughs> Confess their sins. <laughs> Confess your sins. But we don't have to be perfect to be used by God, right? Sure. I think of the Samaritan woman. Jesus meets her at the well, and her life is changed because of who Jesus is. He says, I know everything about you. I know every sin you've ever committed. And she goes to her city immediately after finding right. out he's the Messiah and says, I found him. She didn't have to change every detail of her life. She was prepared to go and reach the people with the knowledge that Jesus is Messiah. But her continued witness in her community would be reflected by her life transformation, I think. So don't wait until your life is perfectly cleaned up to go and witness, but don't also use the grace of God as an excuse to live in whatever sort of way you're desiring to. Finally, in John 17, Jesus says this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So in John 17, Jesus says that unity within the church is an essential part of how the world will know that Jesus has been sent by the Father into this world. He's truly the Son of God, truly the Messiah, truly the Savior of the world. So I think between loving like Jesus, obeying God like Jesus, and walking in unity within the church, there's a lot of important things that we have to do within the walls of the church so that as we go out into the world in imperfection, we're never going to love perfectly, we're never going to obey perfectly, we're never going to be united perfectly, but as we work towards these things and build towards these things, that is going to drastically help our witness of who Jesus is and why they should believe in him. So we should be very careful that we don't compromise. We don't compromise our uh, witness in our life. Paul said in Romans chapter 2 that he never wanted to give anyone a reason to blaspheme God's name because of the way he lived. 
So we don't want to be castaways. We, we want God to be willing to use us. We, we want to join him in his work. He doesn't force anybody to serve him. But I think that's part of the abundant life. If we want to live the abundant life, we're going to be where God is. We're going to be walking with, with God. We're going to be seeing where he's working. We're going to join him in his work, in the work that's eternal. The work that we have, I always said it's, it's a step down to be the president of the United States. To be a servant of God, to be a fellow worker with God in this world, that's where abundance comes from. When you start seeing God using you, when, when you're participating what God's doing in the world, and, and that joy that comes when you see answers to prayer, and even if the person doesn't get saved, but to just share the love of God with them, Amen. it does something to me. Amen. Uh, yes, it's good for them, but it's also good for me, the joy that it gives me to be able to just share the love of God with somebody. Amen. So how are you living into this? How are you doing at this right now? What is holding you back from living into your calling to go out into the world, to share the gospel, to make disciples, mm -hmm. to save souls for him? Are your spiritual eyes open? Are your spiritual ears open? Are you drawing closer to God that you're starting to see where he's working? You're starting to see opportunities. You don't have to make the opportunities happen, but the closer you get to God, God's at work. And I guess my question is, do you want that? Do you want to have that abundant life where you're joining God in what he's doing, where you're seeing lives change, you're seeing God's spirit working, and you're feeling a part of what he's doing in the world? It's the greatest work in the world. Taking somebody who's dead, where God makes them alive in Christ, breathes new life into that person, converts them, regenerates them, and that, uh, that their life is changed, marriage is being restored, and lives being healed. Boy, there's abundant life in working, being sent by God, and being used by Him. Don't Amen. you want into that mission? Don't you want to walk with God and what He's doing in this world? Go to work with Him today. Don't just ask Him to bless what you're doing, but ask Him what He's doing. Ask Him to show you how you can join Him in this blessed work that he is doing in this world to save the souls of the lost, to change their lives, to bring them back to him. So what's preventing you in your heart from saying right now, here I am, Lord, send me. Let's go out into the world. Let's accomplish this thousand day vision hmm. and reach our community with the gospel. You don't have to wait to be perfectly mm. knowledgeable of all the scripture, memorize Ephesians before you can go out there. The woman at the well was ready to go and reach her city with the gospel mm. moments after she came to faith in Jesus. Mm. He'll prepare you where he sends you. He'll be with you and he'll work through you as you go. And we can all rejoice together in the work that he will accomplish through us. Amen.